right, Ms. Mathis? And take it away, Ms. Mathis. Good evening, everyone. I'm Janice Mathis, Executive Director of the National Council of Negro Women. Dr. Cole is unable to join us this evening. We send well wishes her way. I want to begin by thanking our National NCNW Program Committee co-chairs, Ms. Paulette Norville Lewis and Dr. Tamara Wiles Lawson, for their exceptional expertise, their constant support, and their always helpful advice. I also want to thank our dedicated and energetic National Health Equity Committee Chair, Ms. Shara Denton. I want to thank our communications team, led by Director and Strategist, Mr. Kevin Johannes, the smooth voice, Ms. Kayla Allen, who you've already heard, the artistic Ms. Sandra Green and Ms. Ebony Price, and Ms. Triana Perkins, who is on all the teams, for their work in preparation for tonight's Healing Our Children webinar. As Dr. Cole might say, it does no harm to be grateful. Actually, gratitude is one of those better to give than receive emotions. Expressing gratitude leaves us feeling better. As a matter of fact, sometimes the one who expresses gratitude gets a greater sense of satisfaction than the one to whom gratitude is expressed. On behalf of Dr. Cole, all of the NCNW headquarters colleagues, the 32 national membership organizations affiliated with NCNW, the entire executive committee, and the 330 community-based sections of NCNW, we owe a great deal of gratitude to the Honorable Alexis Herman, Ms. Alva Adams, and Toyota of North America for their support of this Healing Our Children of Racial Trauma series that we started about a year ago and that we are concluding tonight. Ms. Patty Stone Cipher's generosity has permitted us to expand the concept of resilience and to introduce an array of practices and tools that make it possible for us to survive a very tumultuous time intact. Her generosity is enabling us to continue the quest for resilience with a new series that begins later this fall called Emotional Health is Wealth. And our speaker tonight, the very able Mr. Ali Smith, will preview a little of that concept with you tonight. Finally, every ship needs a team captain. Every team needs a captain. And our captain over the past several months in this quest for healing our children has been the extraordinary Ms. Lindsay Morton, who you will hear more from in weeks to come. I will conclude with these thoughts. According to anthropologists, active training and meditation-based practices gives people with traumatic stress, whether they are young or old, the opportunity to develop a strong mind-body connection. The experts say, that through heightened awareness, we can focus on the present moment in a way that is often therapeutic. There are studies that indicate that United States women perceive meditation as therapeutic for trauma and that the practice of meditation enables one to focus on the lived present rather than traumatic memories, to accept pain and open one's heart and to make use of silence instead of speech as a healing modality. We hope tonight's program leads you to make that mind-body connection in ways that are healing to you and to your children. Ms. Allen? Thank you, Ms. Mathis. And yes, welcome everyone to the National Council of Negro Women's Health is Wealth webinar, Healing Our Children. And if you have any questions during our webinar, you could type them in the question box. If you have any questions for our speakers during the webinar, you could type them in the question box and they will try their best to address them. And at the end of this webinar, you will receive a brief survey that we are asking that you kindly fill out. And if you follow NCNW on our YouTube channel, you could also see a recap of this webinar. Thank you all once again. And now back to you, Ms. Mathis. At this point, we want to introduce Ms. Shara Denton, who is, I mentioned before, is the very able chair of our National Health Equity Committee where she's doing a stand-up job. She is also a health professional in her day job working with public health in South Georgia. Please welcome Ms. Shara Denton. Good evening, thank you, Ms. Mathis. Thank you for the opportunity to address everyone in this webinar. I am very fortunate to lead the NCNW Health Equity Committee. We have several subcommittees of professional experts in their field to move the conversations and actions of NCNW forward. 
We have targeted six key health initiatives that affect women of African descent, their families, and communities. The subcommittees include affordable health care, breast cancer, HIV AIDS, COVID-19, maternal health, and mental health. We already hit the ground running providing informative events, town halls, and webinars like this one as it relates to our health targets. We are extremely grateful for this partnership with Toyota and CNW and all that it has yielded with such positive results. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Denton. And now I'd like to introduce Ms. Paulette Norvell Lewis, who is a veteran in terms of program design and implementation, long-term consultant, uh, high-ranking employee with the United States Department of Labor, brings to us a wealth of experience and expertise, which she so willingly shares with us. She was really the brains and the innovation behind our whole financial literacy program that we present, Women's Economic Empowerment and Millennial Entrepreneurs, and gives us great advice. Please welcome Ms. Paulette Norvell Lewis, National Co-Chair of the Program Committee. Ms. Mavis, she actually is not on the panel today or right now, so we're going to move to Mr. Smith. <laughs> okay, uh, and I can I am pitch hitting for our moderator this evening, but it's going to be all right. Mr. Ali Smith comes to us highly recommended. He has established a wide ranging practice in 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 mindfulness and meditation, uh, which incorporates tools such as yoga teaching us how to survive these tumultuous times. We're so glad that he could join us this evening. Please welcome Mr. Ali Smith. Thank y'all for having me. Appreciate, appreciate being here. Let's see, I think that we want to start with some questions. And let's see, um, Ali, let's start with a question. Uh, what exactly is mindfulness? How does it work? And what are the benefits to our brain and our bodies? All right, so uh, first, there's a lot of different definitions of mindfulness. Um, at the Holistic Life Foundation, we kind of came up with our own definition that, that works for us and the people that we serve. Um, mindfulness is a combination of centering, awareness, and presence. Um, centering, just being able to find center and get back to it from moment to moment. Uh, nobody's going to be at center all the time. You're not going to be just it's like stable and present all the time. But the key is to be able to know when you're drifting away from it and how to get yourself back to center. Uh, awareness of your your interactions with yourself, your interaction with others, um, your thoughts, your words, your actions, and presence. Just being in that present moment. A lot of people spend most of their time in the past or the future. Uh, my teacher used to always say hanging in the past causes a lot of anger uh, because of things you might have missed out on, regrets you might have. Hanging out in the future causes a lot of anxiety because you're worrying about what might happen. Uh, you got to focus on the now. And if you can stay in the present moment, it brings a lot of peace. Um, so that's pretty much what mindfulness is. Um, you said the benefits, um, there's a lot of benefits physiologically and neurologically. Um, I guess starting off with um, just bringing peace to peace of mind and peace to the body. Uh, when you're when you're um, when you're mindful and you're present, it starts to slow, slow things down. It has a lot of benefits to trauma, but we'll get into that later. Uh, but I mean, it has it has tons of benefits. Um, it, it helps reduce your heart rate, um, helps reduce your blood pressure, helps to slow your thoughts down, reducing the anxiety and stress and things along those lines. Uh, so there's, there's, there's numerous benefits to mindfulness. Thank you so much for joining us on this virtual stage tonight. We know that you're the co-founder of the Holistic Life Foundation, a Baltimore-based nonprofit that is teaching children about mindfulness and how to center themselves through meditation and yoga. Um, tell us a little more about yourself and about the Holistic Life Foundation. Sure, um, so I started meditating as a kid. Uh, my parents were into the practice. I mean, we grew up in West Baltimore. Uh, so, I mean, I didn't, I didn't think there was any, I didn't know of anybody else that was meditating anywhere in my neighborhood or, or other than at the, the church we grew up in. Uh, but my dad would make me wake me and my brother up in the morning. And we would meditate every morning before school. Um, you know, it was like clockwork. It was meditation uh, and then breakfast with like Woody Woodpecker and school we do in the morning and then straight off to school. Uh, we, I, I mean, I don't, I don't remember how early I started. I don't remember really not meditating. Um, and then I remember uh, getting out of it uh, when my parents split. Uh, I guess that was in about the fifth or sixth grade and then getting out of the practice and then getting back into it. 
um, as uh, going into my, I guess my junior year in college, uh, me and my brother's godfather was one of those people that got into yoga in the 60s, like the early 60s, and uh, never ever got out of it. And um, he was willing to teach us if we promised to be teachers and teach as many people as possible. So uh, I think that got us really deep into the breath work, the meditation, uh, more the contemplative practices, and then deeper what our meditation practice. Uh, the Holistic Life Foundation kind of, I guess the seeds were planted uh, by my parents and my godfather uh, early on, I guess before I was even born, because that was when they were getting into the practice. Um, and we decided that uh, when he, when our godfather, our teacher, made his promise to be teach as many people as possible, uh, we decided that we were, we need to figure out a way to do that. Uh, we started a nonprofit fresh out of college because uh, our father was big on entrepreneurship. Uh, he didn't want us to go get jobs. He said it would help support us. Uh, he, was, he was a big proponent of um, don't go earn a check, go beat a check. Um, he had a lot of friends that were being downsized and, and losing their pensions, a lot of horrible things that, that put in a lot of um, loyal work to the companies that they were working for. So he decided that he wanted us to, to start our own business. So we did. And the Holistic Life Foundation was what that was. Um, we wanted to bring these. Pro uh, we started off with our goal of bringing these services and uh, yoga, mindfulness, breath work, um, meditation. Uh, to underserved communities and that was that was what we did and um we've been having a great track record we've, we've done a lot of great work um we started off in west baltimore and now our reach is around the world and that is wonderful you've already talked about your earliest memory of practicing mindfulness those meditation sessions with your father early in the morning is it accurate to say that meditation is a form of mindfulness how should we think about that what are some of the other ways that we can practice mindfulness? So I think, the, so mindfulness and meditation are very similar. I say the one good thing about mindfulness is that anything can be done mindfully. Um, mindfulness, anything can be done when, when you're present with it. Um, that means you're doing it mindfully. So you can, like you can be driving down a highway and you can be driving and you can have those moments where you look up and you're 50 miles down the highway and you don't even know how you got there. Or you can be present with your drive present with your thoughts, present with your surroundings. Um, you could be cooking dinner or you could be talking, even a conversation with somebody. Like a lot of times people have a conversation with, a, with another person and they're not present or they're not mindful in that conversation. They're just waiting for their turn to speak or their mind's off wandering somewhere. So anything you do can be done mindfully. And there's certain things that bring presence to different people. So for me, it might be uh, being, I'm, a, I'm an earth sign, I'm a Taurus. So like being out in nature, garden and stuff like that brings me presence. Um, of course, meditation practice, uh, for some people, it might be cooking. For some people, it might be jogging. Uh, for some people, it might be music. It's, it, there's a lot of different things that naturally bring you to that present state. But with a little effort and a little practice, anything can be done um, mindfully. Uh, meditation and mindfulness are a little different. Uh, mindfulness is more awareness practices. Uh, meditation, and in its truest form, like when I was learning it as a kid, um, and what I practice in my in my and at home uh, in my own personal practice, uh, my teacher described it best. He was said that. Um, and this is what we teach us in the, in the schools. We teach awareness practices because there's that separation of, of church and state. But uh, my teacher always describe it as meditation is the opposite of prayer. Um, when you're when you're praying, you're asking, you're asking God or the universe for something. And the whole thing with yoga is the yoga. The belief in yoga is that um, God or the light of the universe shines inside of everyone and everything. So meditation is that point where you can slow your mind down enough to be able to hear what's being said back to you. So prayer is the ask, and meditation is when you listen to what's being said back. Wow, you put a lot in a few sentences. Can you explain to us why these practices have stuck with you and been so significant, obviously, to you through the years? Uh, I say because they work. As you get older, life just gets more and more stressful. So, like, you gotta have tools to be able to deal with it. Um, I think, I think one of the things that made me appreciate it the most was losing my practice. Because, uh, like I said, I grew up meditating, and in about fifth or sixth grade, I stopped meditating. I didn't meditate again until. My, like my the end of my junior year in college. So there were all those years of life, life getting more stressful. And then, you know, it was like getting, when I got back to it, when my, when my teacher reintroduced me to it, it was like uh, getting reacquainted with an old friend. You know what I mean? It was like, oh, that's what I've been missing. So it gives you that, because the world is chaotic, your mind is chaotic. Um, and as you get older, like I was saying, life just gets more stressful. So if you can find a place of inner peace amongst all that, that you can always go back to, I mean, it's it's a gift. So. I think that's why I think that's why it stuck with me because because it works and um, yeah it just I, I just I, I like the, like I feel like you're more in tune with yourself and and everything around you when you are meditating you can get that stillness 
and your mind isn't just going causing all that commotion. Wow. You started learning, obviously, how to be grounded as a child and went on to start your foundation. And it sounds as if a lot of your work is centered around children. Uh, why are children and young people at the center of your work if they are? I say, I mean, I, I think we always uh, were under the, the impression that it was better for us to get these practices to people earlier. Um, the earlier you can get them in your life and the earlier you have them, the, the, you have them for the rest of the tool that no one can ever take away from you. Um, if you know inner peace, no one can ever take that from you. You might forget to go back to it, but you do know how to get there. And you do know how to find it. You do know what it feels like. Um, and also, like, uh, kids are sponges at an early age. You know what I mean? Like, as they start to get older, they start to get stuck in their ways or things might not seem cool to their friends. But if, if, if you catch them early enough, I mean, they're, they're wide open and they're sponges and they take to the practice um, and they become natural leaders. And the cool thing is, like, always seeing the kids, like, we use a reciprocal teaching model when we teach, where we bring the kids up to the front to lead. And it does a lot for the kids because the kids end up, they, they know how to teach, they gain self, like, they gain self-confidence, they, they, they gain leadership experience, but then they also feel more comfortable going out into the world and sharing these practices. So it's like, you know, we can go to school and work with 200 kids and that's awesome. Like we, we help 200 kids, but if we could turn all 200 of those kids into teachers, then we make a big ripple in the community and out in the world. And that's, that's what we've been trying to do. Well, that is that is certainly just amazing work that you are doing. You know, um, how do you approach children? It seems, and I'm glad you mentioned the concept of the sponge because it's like language or swimming or any other thing. It's so much easier to learn when you're a child because you are malleable. Um, but how do you and your team of instructors approach children in their first lessons? Um, and I'm saying willing to still and be silent for extended periods of time to listen that takes a long that that willingness to be still and sit still like be silent for a long period of time that come that that takes a little while to get there uh but you know they eventually get there but i think the things that we do i think it's authenticity i think it's love and i think it's fun um like we always like our i think one thing i love about our staff is that everybody's themselves like we're very authentic we have our own practice so it's not like we're going in there teaching something from theory, we're teaching from experience. Uh, the love, I mean, love is the most powerful force in the universe. So if you can, um, if you come from a place of love, it, it kind of, it pulls kids in. Uh, Cause a lot of kids, they don't have anyone that um, that they might feel loves them. But like, if you can drill, like build that bond with them, it starts to break down those walls and those barriers that the kids have built up, then they become even more open to learning. And, and then just making it fun. I mean, there's too many, I mean, I, things are boring. I mean, you can teach anything in a boring way or a fun way. Our teacher used to always tell us that, like, if your students aren't laughing, you're not doing a good job, because uh, because fun resonates, joy resonates. So if you can, if they're learning these practices and they associate with having fun and laughing and smiling, they're more likely to go back to them than if you teach them to them as like a punishment, like go over there and go meditate. You were bad, or like you teach them in a real boring way. It's like that fun factor means a lot when you're working with kids. Oh, and and they're getting them to be still. Uh, again, it takes a long time. Uh, so, I mean, you know, you might walk into a classroom and one kid might just be into it. Like they might just drop in, be quiet, meditate. Like this is just some kids' personalities. But I think with a lot of kids, it's 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 over time um, getting them to get used to uh, moving their body. Like the physical yoga plays a key role in that because uh, it starts to slow down their body. Then the breath work starts to slow down their mind. And then eventually they get into the stillness of meditation. Uh, it's funny when we would have um, funders and, and visitors come visit our after school program. You know, we like we like to have fun with the kids. So we'd be in the gym like playing dodgeball and basketball and football, It'd be like me, Ottman, and our other co-founder Andy, like just in the gym, like wilding out with like 65 kids. And they're looking wow. at us like we're crazy. Like they're looking at us like we're crazy. And they're like, some like how how is this gonna turn into big kids being still? And then they'd be shocked that like, you know, like we put the balls away, everybody gets on their mats, they're rambunctious when they're doing the movement, but you, you burn off that energy, then they can sit still, then you do them, get them to do some breathing, then their minds can be still. Then you get them out for like a guided meditation practice and you can hear a pin drop in there. But it's just it's progressive and it takes a lot of patience uh, because it's always going to be kids that don't want to get into it for whatever reason. But eventually they all can get there. You know, you talked about your practice being started in Baltimore and, and now stretching across the world. Baltimore is a big urban city with lots of different kinds of people, but there are some underserved neighborhoods. What's your experience being working with children? And you said something that was so poignant, tugged on my heartstrings. They may not know anybody who loves them. Well, how does that play into the work that you're doing? The fact that some children may be from 
um, underserved backgrounds? So I think a lot of that, um, I think uh, trauma comes up heavily in, in neighborhoods like that uh, because the kids, uh, my brother always talks about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like a lot of those kids don't have those needs met. So like you're trying to get them to learn how to do fractions and they haven't had breakfast like or they might not have a coat and a cold like they're not really going to care about that or, or they might just be heavily traumatized and, and i think a lot of the behavior problems that people see in schools aren't behavior problems they're trauma problems um people who have been traumatized their prefrontal cortex um where all the executive function is like uh, those, those higher functions of the brain it's not accessible to them uh their brain's in survival mode so a, a lot of so they so like they're very impulsive um, they might see everything as a threat, um, so that they might be very um, reactionary, they might be more violent, and and, it, and they might not be able to focus in class. And the, the teachers are thinking this, or I know we did, we were too. When we were working with kids at first, we thought it was behavior issues, but when you really looked at it, those were all those were all trauma issues. And if you can teach the practices in a trauma informed way, uh, you can teach the kids how to heal their trauma and then go forward um, and, and start and start to like um, live a more fruitful and productive and peaceful life inwardly and outwardly so would it be correct to say that instead of accessing that prefrontal cortex and those executive functions they're sort of in fight or flight mode all the time um the autonomic nervous system um is uh is set to parasympathetic and sympathetic parasympathetic is that rest state sympathetic is that um is that stress state so a lot of kids live in sympathetic dominance where they're always in that stress state uh, that fight or flight side of their of their autonomic nervous system where it's like you know their the cortisol is pumping through their body the adrenaline is flowing pupils are dilated they're breathing they're breathing really shallow um and they're constantly stressed and like you know if it's if it's time for you to survive like you have to be in stress mode because it'll, it'll help save your life but if you live in stress mode it's slowly killing you and a lot of kids don't know how to get from sympathetic to parasympathetic dominance and a lot of these practices that's what they're for are to be able to slow you down and be so you can see so you, you should be able to flow between the two naturally you're in parasympathetic dominance something happens in your life where you need you need that adrenaline flowing you do need your people's dilate you need all these things going on to save your life but then once that experience is over you need to be go be able to go back to parasympathetic dominance and be in that relaxed state so i think that's a lot of what we're showing them is how to flow naturally between the two and not just get stuck in that stress state where it's slowly starting to kill them that is truly fascinating what kind of response are you getting from teachers and parents and administrators and others who you know school counselors for example who might be in the children's lives as well when they have been through this experience so i know the funny thing was like the first year that we did our after school program this was um March of 2002 was our first after school program. Uh, we got 15 fifth grade boys and we were in the basement of the school. The teacher, the, the principal wanted us to coach football. And um, we, you know, we were like, well, can we do an after school yoga program? You know, in 2002, what, not, there weren't many people in Baltimore talking about yoga. I mean, there weren't many school based yoga programs anywhere in the country at that point. And um, the, the principal was like, fine, as long as you don't work with them. Um, you know, we start off like picking up most of the kids from detention, breaking up fights every day to, I mean, we weren't breaking up any fights. Our kids weren't in detention anymore. And then the parents, the teachers, the administrators, the principal would all be like, we don't know what y'all are doing, but whatever y'all are doing, keep doing it because it's working. <laughs> and then, you know what I mean? And it just kept growing from there where it's like now um, the, like the, the kids are going home and teaching their parents because uh, that reciprocal teaching model, like the parent, their mom or dad might come home stressed. And they can see, you know, that stress domino, stress goes downhill. Like the parent might get screamed on by their boss. They scream on their kid. The big brother punches the little brother. You know what I mean? Like it's just going downhill. And our students, like they'll see their parent come in the house nice and stressed out. Be like, whoa, let, let's sit down on the couch. Let's do some breathing together. Let's meditate together. So um, the, the parents of it, the, 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 the teachers, um, I think they have to do less classroom management. Um, and like the overall classroom environment is more peaceful. And the administrators and the principals they love it because the, the the stuff that they're um that they're held accountable for uh, those numbers are going down like uh suspension numbers go way down um office referrals um grades and test scores go up uh there's school um i can't think of the name of school um ah, but, but, but the first, but year before we got there there was like 175 or so suspensions uh the, the first year after the first year 
those suspensions were down to like 53. And after the second year, those suspensions were down to 13. Um, there's a school called Robert W. Coleman Elementary School in the heart of where the Freddie Ray uprisings happened. And they haven't had a suspension there in like, I don't know, maybe like eight years now. Uh, so, and then just as far as the test scores go, um, there's a school that we set up a program at in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, where um, the, the person that we set up the room and the mindful ambassadors, like the students in the school that were teaching the mindfulness as well, um, taught all the kids a breathing exercise heading into the ACTs. Um, and the, the, all the kids did the breath uh, and they got the highest ACT scores in school history. Uh, and then they did a survey and the post and the surveys, they, 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 all the kids at the school attributed uh, their high ACT scores and how well they did on the exam uh, was to not being stressed. Like they did the breath, they calmed them down, wow. they slowed them down, they could focus on the information that they had to get out of their mind and through their hands onto the paper and not just on being stressed out and, and worrying and just worrying. What a what a recommendation. It sounds like it should be in every school. And you know, it sounds like your dad had this idea, sounds like maybe 30, maybe even 40 years ago. And I just wonder where did he get it from? It was it would have been such an unusual, uncommon thing to get your kids up to meditate before school. Do you know where he got that from? Yeah, so it was like my mom, my dad, and my godfather. So my, my dad had a prostate issue. Um, and he went to my godfather and he was like, well, he didn't enjoy the prostate exam. And my godfather was like, do these four things and uh, and, and it'll it'll you'll never have a prostate issue again. Uh, my dad was a PE teacher, so he's really into physical fitness. So he showed him four. it was four yoga poses. It healed his prostate issue, hadn't had a prostate issue since. And my dad's uh, pushing 80 now and that hadn't had a prostate. Uh, so it was um, so that got him hooked. So him and my godfather, and my mom. We'll go to um, all these different places to learn um, meditation and yoga, breath work. Uh, my mom really got into the Ayurvedic cooking side of things. Um, I think her practice was more based in prayer than meditation. I mean, she meditates, but I think I think prayer is the way that she that she speaks to God in the universe. And uh, so I think it was it was natural that once they they were into it, so we didn't really we didn't really have a choice. Like we were going to be into it, and, and we and they got us into it. You know, um, my dad was a Methodist preacher, and it, it embarrassed us no end when he would, I didn't care where you were, in the mall or the, anywhere, he'd say, let's huddle. He's also a football coach, and let's huddle, that meant let's pray. And the four of us would get in a huddle and pray anytime, anywhere, for any reason. But after a while, it got to be not so embarrassing, but a way to get through tough situations in life, and really just to find that center. So I can, I can sort of identify that, but let's move on. Uh, what tips do you have for the audience on how they can increase the emotional resilience in the children in their lives, especially with the new school year and the pandemic and the racism and the duh, 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 duh. What can parents and caregivers model and, and do with their kids? Um, I think the, the first thing is just listen to the kids. A lot of kids don't feel heard. Um, I think they feel like they don't really have a voice. So um, the practices of like mindful listening, where you're just um, you're actually there and you're present with someone and you're not waiting for what you're going to say or trying to judge what they're going to say or tell them how they should feel, or what they should do. Um, I think I think that empowers kids a lot and, and gives them a, a like when kids have a voice, it changes the whole thing and it opens them up. Um, I think that's one thing um, to have some type of practice with your kids, whatever it is, and be consistent with it, whether it's prayer, like you were talking about, whether it's meditation whether it's some breath work, whether it's mindful walking, whether it's time in nature, um, whether it's physical yoga, whatever it is, um, kids need, I mean, kids and adults, everybody needs a space to be able to um, kind of relieve their stress and kind of dump all those thoughts and clear their mind and be able to um, just just relax a little bit. So I think I think those are, are two of the keys. And, and also, I think um, letting them have some ownership of the practice the way it is. Uh, and not just put your what you want your kids to be doing, um, but you know, like teaching them a couple things and see what resonates with them. Ask them how they feel. Uh, like my two sons, um, we I know I wanted them to own their practice. So you know, like I would get up in the morning and meditate with my dad, but uh, my oldest son he would fall asleep in the mornings all the time. So we we stopped meditating in the morning. We would meditate at night. Um, I found out what parts he liked about the yogic practice, and then we built the practice around what he enjoyed. And then, um, then, then that way, it, it was his practice. He took ownership of it. Um, and I, you know, early on, I would, I would make, we, I would make him meditate every day. And then, 
I kind of stepped off. And then he, well, then when he he realized that I wasn't doing it anymore, he was fine. But then at school got a little stressful. I think it was like maybe just a rookie. It must have been like second or second or third grade. I can't remember where it was. He was like, Dad, uh, I want to start meditating again. And I was like, All right, good. So he understands what he had and what he was missing. And go. And now he can he can meditate on his own. We still meditate together. Um, and start them when they're ready. Uh, don't force it on them if they're not ready. Like my youngest, my oldest son uh, started asking questions when he was like three and a half. Uh, cause he would see me on my mat breathing and meditating, doing yoga. And when he started asking the right questions, I started teaching him. Um, my youngest son, we probably didn't start with him until he was around five. He was more of a physical kid and he wasn't really, he, I mean, we weren't going to force him to do it. But uh, once one day he was like, I want to I start doing that. And then he started with us. So I, th I think it's a lot. Um, just I think listening to your kids, starting them when they're ready, uh, being consistent with it and letting them have some some ownership of the practice uh, will be, all be things to kind of help get the practice of the kids. Could you repeat those four bullet points again? I think those were just very pithy. Yeah, um, being consistent with the practice. Um, like you can't just, like, even if you do it for a couple minutes, as long as you do it every day, the kids get used to it. Um, letting them take ownership of the practice so it becomes theirs. Um, not working with them in a way where um, you start with them when they're ready. And well, I don't remember what the fourth one was. Ms. Mathis, I don't remember what the, I remember there was a fourth one, but I don't remember what it was. Um, the um, was it the being flexible and getting the feedback from them, letting them own it. Yeah, let them own it. Let them own. Definitely let them own it. Um, they got to be yeah. able to own the practice. Yeah, there's a there's a book in those four. Those those four would go a long way. So um, me, actually, me and my son are working on that. Me and my oldest. Me and my actually it was me and my oldest son, but now it's me and both of them uh, are working on a book for meditation for parents and kids. I think that would be awesome. Do you think that these practices, this bundle of practices, sounds like you've built your, these children build toolkits, your students as well as your own sons, that they can go back to and access them as they are needed. Do you think that these tools work just as well for children who've experienced more serious kinds of trauma or emotional issues? Um, I definitely do. I think excuse me i think they definitely work i think they just have to be taught in a little bit different way um so like um first like kids who have been traumatized their body doesn't feel safe for them uh so you got to make the body a safe space um like pro proprioceptive input is like the signal that your like your um your skin your joints your muscles send to your brain and it helps with self-regulation and uh, for people who've been traumatized that signal that's being sent is fear uh, so like the yogic practice, like being present in the poses, um, they feel they start to feel safe in that moment. Then their body becomes a safe space because you got because um, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. If you got if you all have never read um, the Body Keeps the Score, uh, it's a great book on great resource on trauma. Uh, but he says that trauma stored in the body, and you got to make the body safe space before you can start working with the mind. Um, when you teach meditations, you can't leave space in the meditation. So like. We work in a group that's been traumatized. We won't do mindfulness meditation where kids just sit in silence because that silence allows all that trauma to come up. Uh, we do guided meditations. So like they learn what inner peace is, they learn what stillness is, but it's a guided safe stillness instead of a vacuum and all that trauma can come up. Um, a lot of given choices, um, we, we, we don't like, we want to empower the kids. So like when, when they're in a pose, we let them express the pose the way that their body wants to instead of making adjustments. Uh, we welcome them to close their eyes. We don't force them to close their eyes. Uh, we help them to start using the breath to be able to calm the mind. Um, and the, the reciprocal teaching model empowers kids. And a lot of people have been traumatized, have had their power taken away. Um, and then I guess the most important thing is treating them with love. Um, we were talking to, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk on our, um, on our podcast. And he's like the world's foremost expert on trauma. Like his book's been on the New York Times bestseller list forever. And uh, we we were asking about the best ways to treat to help people heal from trauma, and he was like, "Well, you guys are already doing it." And we're we're throwing out like, "Well, we mean the yoga, the breath work, the meditation." He's like, "No, nah, like treat people with love. Like that's the most important thing that you you say you can heal." He said, "You can heal any form of trauma other than like um brain trauma, like physical brain trauma, like because I mean then your brain's different." But he said, "You can heal any form of trauma by healing, treating people with love." And hearing him say that meant a lot because I mean that's I mean we that's what we felt. But hearing like the world's foremost experts say it was like really, really made it hit home. 
I keep thinking about something you said earlier, which I'm, I'm into this because it works. The results prove the concept. We've had a great conversation. I really appreciate it so far, but I think it might be helpful for our audience to watch and to learn a technique. Can you do a little demonstration for us? I would love to, because um, I can talk about it all day, but it's a difference in experiencing it. You know what I mean? Like, like I could talk about the research, I could talk about it, but like actually feeling it uh, is different. So uh, we're gonna do a, a center and practice, like a meditation on the breath. Uh, your breath is a tool that you always have with you from the moment you're born to the time you transition out of here. So if you can use your breath to slow yourself down and calm yourself down and bring yourself inner peace, uh, becomes an invaluable tool. So this is going to be a real simple, uh, we won't go for too long, we'll go for a few minutes, but a, a meditation or center and practice on the breath. Uh, so if everybody can get in a comfortable meditating position, uh, you want to have your back, neck, and head aligned, not uncomfortably, but you do want them, you do want them aligned. Uh, you can rest your hands in your lap. Um, if, you're, if it's accessible to you, you can root your feet in the floor. Uh, and I welcome you to close your eyes. Uh, all the breaths for this practice are going to be in and out through your nose and all the way down to your belly. So we're going to start with a couple centering breaths. We're going to inhale nice and deeply, filling our belly and our lungs. And we're going to exhale and feel our lungs fall and push our belly in. Inhale again deeply, filling your belly and your lungs. And exhale it out, filling your lungs fall, push your belly in. All right, one more together. Inhale deeply, filling your belly and your lungs. And exhale, feel your lungs fall, push your belly in. All right, now continue breathing on your own at a nice, comfortable, relaxed pace. Something you don't put any effort into whatsoever. Just let your body naturally breathe. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to bring our awareness to how our breath feels. How it feels going in and out through our noses and the feeling of the rising and falling of our belly as I breathe. Any physical sensation you're feeling right now, whether it's your connection to the chair, the position your body's in, temperature of the room you're in, texture of your clothes against your body, go ahead and acknowledge all those physical sensations and pull your sense of feel to the breath. Feel it going in and out through your nose. You're feeling the rising and falling of your belly as you breathe. Hold your awareness right there. If you get distracted by a physical sensation, I just acknowledge it. Don't want to carry your mind or your awareness off too far. Once you acknowledge it, bring your awareness back to the breath, feeling it going in and out through your nose. Feel the rising and falling of your belly with every inhale and every exhale. And just keep doing it. Every time you're wearing the slips, bring it back. That's a part of the practice is the slipping. But the key part of the practice is bringing your awareness back. So every time your awareness slips away, bring it back to feeling the breath. Feel it going in and out through your nose. And feel the rising and falling of your belly with every single breath. All right, now along with feeling your breath, we're going to pay attention to how that breath sounds. No matter how soft or loud your breath is, you're going to hold your awareness right there. Once you connect to it, you notice the sound of the inhale and the sound of the exhale is slightly different. So all your awareness is going to be on feeling and hearing the breath. Feel it going in and out through your nose, feel the rising and falling of your belly, feel the sound of the inhale, feel the sound of the exhale. Hold your awareness right there. If you do get distracted by sound or a physical sensation, again, don't let it carry your awareness off too far or make your mind wander too much. Once you notice it slip, just acknowledge what the distraction was and bring your awareness right back to feeling and hearing the breath. Feel it going in and out through your nose, 
Feel the rising and falling of your belly. You can hear the sound of the inhale, the sound of the exhale. Right now, we're also going to center our mind on the breath as well. Uh, the mind is made to make thoughts. So thoughts are going to pop in your mind during the meditation. The key is not to fight with your mind and try to block the thoughts out. But just the thoughts pop up, just acknowledge them. Don't take ownership of the thoughts. Don't judge the thoughts. Just acknowledge the thoughts. You're just the witness of them. And right after you acknowledge it, let the thought drift away and bring your mind to the breath. Another thought pops up. Acknowledge it without ownership or judgment. Bring your mind to the breath. Just keep recentering your mind on the breath. All your awareness is going to be on feeling, hearing, and centering your mind on the breath. Feel it going out through your nose, to the rising and falling of your belly. Hear the sound of the inhale. Hear the sound of the exhale. And keep recentering your mind on the breath. Anytime you get distraction, whether it's an internal distraction of a thought, external distraction of a physical sensation or sound. Don't let it carry your mind off too far. Don't let it carry your awareness off too far. Just gently acknowledge it and bring your awareness back to the breath. Feel it, hear it, and center your mind on it. Let everything else drift away and just be one with your breath. All right, let's slowly bring awareness away from our breath and back to our body. All right, you can keep yourself still, keep your eyes closed, we'll gradually bring ourselves out. You can start by very, very lightly wiggling your fingers and toes. You can roll your wrists and roll your ankles a little bit. Move your head a little bit from side to side. And then whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and slowly, slowly open up your eyes. And that was a nice simple practice to centering yourself on the breath. Again, it was just uh, feeling the breath, then feeling and hearing the breath, and then feeling, hearing, and centering your mind on the breath and just gradually going through it. Uh, you can do it for as long as you want to, as short as you want to. Um, you know, and the key with meditation is being consistent with it. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad meditation. Every single time you meditate, you get exactly what you're supposed to get out of it. Uh, the key is just the consistency. So as long as you're doing it every day, you're doing it the right way. Mathis, did you want to head to audience questions or did you have? Oh, yes, I was carried away. Um, <laughs> no, sorry, sorry. How was that? If, if you've got, if you want to share, please, you can share in the chat if you feel comfortable about what, how the demo affected you. And if there are any practices that you have worked on that work for you or your children, please share that in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear your questions. We'll read a few questions that come through the chat and see if we can't get a discussion. Thank you, Mr. Smith. That was quite an experience. You're very welcome. We too have one, Ms. Gina Barboza. Okay. Ms. Gina, would you like to speak? Yes, how are you? First of all, I'm in a noisy place, so my apologies, but um, 
I, I, I gotta say, I've been, I've been blessed to practice with Mr. Smith in the past. So I'm very happy that you have him here. And um, Ms., Ms. Janice, you and I have spoke as well um, about some things at the, the Negro Council for Women. Um, so my question to you, uh, Mr. Smith, is what does somebody have to do to get training to uh, be a teacher at the Holistic Life Foundation? And I'll go ahead and meet you guys because it's noisy where I'm at. And thank you for the, the meditation. And thank you for that question. Yeah, good to hear. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so training with the Holistic Life Foundation. Uh, so we do a workforce development program every single year uh, to hire new teachers. Um, and we also, um, so we, we train people to be able to, I mean, because, you know, like we, the, the more staff we have, the more people we can serve. So we do a workforce development program, but we also offer teacher trainings. It's so like if you're interested in doing this in your community on your own or starting an organization, uh, just reach out to the Holistic Life Foundation. We can set up a training for you. Like I said, we've gone, we've gone all around the world to set these programs up and to train people. Um, so, and you know, we like to travel, we like to train, so it, it works out well. And um, we give you the tools you need. And, and you mentioned this earlier, Ms. Mathis, about the toolbox. Um, we, we don't teach people to, to, to teach from a curriculum uh, because that's not the way you're going to best serve the students that you're working with. Um, we believe in teaching them how to have a, like arming them with a huge toolbox of practices so they can go in and listen to the kids and see what the kids actually need and teach them in a, from a way that's actually going to best serve them instead of like trying to read from a script. Like have your own practice, have a big toolbox, and you'll be able to serve uh, anybody you want to serve. That's so important. Here's another question. It says, I really enjoyed the discussion, but I'm wondering how do I introduce this to my three-year-old who is pretty anxious about starting pre-k this week great question um so three-year-olds got to start with some type of movement um there's plenty of, there's a lot of good yoga videos out there um there's um actually we have a, a good online tool called bridging academics in the mind um where we have like animations of the three co-founders doing movement and breath work and stuff but uh if youtube you can find some movement Start with movement for a three-year-old. Then the, the so just doing some deep breathing will help to center them. Uh, when you're working with kids that young, just having them do a regular breathing isn't really going to work. Um, a lot of people use these things called belly buddies or breathing buddies. Like where they get their favorite toy or their favorite stuffed animal, and they put it on their belly, and they'll get them to lay down flat on their back, and their gaze is looking down at their belly buddy. So then every time they inhale, their belly buddy goes up, and every time they exhale, their belly buddy goes down. And just the movement of their belly is going to force them to take long, slow, deep breaths. Because most people only breathe with the top 10% of their lungs. And they're pretty much panting. But all your lung capacity is in your lower lungs. So if you can breathe uh, down to your belly, it's, it's, you're not really filling your belly with air. It's your diaphragm. It's expanding and forcing you to use your lower lungs. A lot of singers uh, know about this. Like singers usually breathe the right way because they know how to take a deep breath and exhale and, and push all that air out. Uh, so I think the, the combination of the movement and some breath work will be good for a three-year-old. Okay. Let's see. Are there any other questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Yeah, don't be shy. Come on, give us some questions. Which mindfulness techniques work best for teens? Great question. Uh, for teens, uh, the, mo the practices that are the most inconspicuous, um, like the things that you can have them doing where it doesn't look like they're doing anything, uh, work the best. Uh, a lot of them don't want to be singled out or look like they're paying attention or look like they're doing something different from the crowd. So a lot of the breath work works, the meditations work, um, a lot of the mindfulness practices work uh, because, you know, they can stick their earbuds in and be practicing on the bus. They can practice in walking down the hall. Um, they can practice at home. They can practice around their friends. And it's, it looks like they're just, I mean, I guess AirPods, people don't use earbuds anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, like any of the practices where it doesn't look like they're doing anything. A lot of the discussions um, with the younger kids, we do a lot of movement. Uh, with the older, with the teens, we don't do too much movement. It's more uh, discussions based around mindfulness topics, uh, breath work, and meditations. How were you able to connect to the school system? Um, honestly, first it was our mom. Our mom was facilitating a, a social emotional learning program. Uh, at an elementary school and the principal saw us coming by and asked us to do an after school program. Uh, from there, it was, um, we did the first randomized control study 
on yoga and mindfulness, the effects of yoga and mindfulness on urban youth uh, with Johns Hopkins and Penn State. Uh, we got an article published in the Journal of Abnormal Child Psychology. Uh, we did two rounds of that study. And uh, I think after that, it added some validity to what we were doing. Uh, we actually had like um, concrete numbers behind what we we're doing. Um, so I think a lot of cognitive measures, not really any school-based measures at that point. Uh, so I say that helped us. And then once we started doing school-based measures, looking at suspensions, test scores, attendance, grades, things along those lines, I think that helps get to, get into schools because we have like the cognitive measures, like the sign on the science side of things, that we have like um, data on the, um, the the school like the school-based measures. And I think um, having data is the easiest way to get into schools. Um, you got to have numbers behind what you're doing uh, because I mean everybody loves to feel good stories and, and and they're awesome, but like you you have to have numbers and data behind what you're doing. Thank you. And to start, how long should a three, seven, and 11 year old meditate? As long as they can, because uh, everybody's going to be different. Everybody's going to be a little bit like, you know, like start them off really, really slow, uh, just a couple minutes. If they can handle more, they can handle more. You can usually tell, um, like, you're going to have to send, like, um, just cues of, like, hey, let's uh, remember, like, so a three year old, you might, they, you might just get them to just lay still and get used to their body being still. And throwing out their mind is like, hey, remember, don't don't look at your fingers. Hey, remember, don't, don't do this. And like, just get them to where they can just be still. Seven year old, you can go deeper with the practice. Um, like again, it's just whenever they start to fidget and you feel like they need to come out. Um, Eleven year old, same thing. Uh, but it's it's just going to be an individual. Uh, it's going to be individual for everybody because I've known some seven year olds that can meditate as longer than people that have been meditating for twenty or thirty years. So uh, it's just how they take to the practice and just individualizing it because everybody's practice is different um and, and that's the thing you got to take ownership of your practice it's got to be something that's going to work for you and uh same thing with with, with if you're working with your kids it's got to be something that's going to work for them so like um if they can meditate longer let them go longer if they just can go for five minutes let them go for five minutes they can go for two minutes let them go for two minutes but that time is going to increase as they become more comfortable with the practice and they become more comfortable with just being still inwardly and outwardly can you tell us again, how do you begin a mindfulness routine? Uh, with the breath. We always start with the breath. Um, teach people how to breathe. It's um, it's something, it's it's one of the most powerful tools you have is being able to take a proper deep breath. So we'll go into the, the physiological and neurological benefits of how to take a deep breath. We'll show them how to take a deep breath. Um, you know, just like, the, just, just the simple thing of breathing in and out through your nose. Like your nose is a natural filtration system. It's a humidifier and it's a heater. You don't get any of those benefits breathing out through your mouth. Uh, show them how to access their lower lungs and not just be panting. Uh, show them how to like clear their mind with the breath. So every single class that we start that we teach starts off with how to take a deep breath. Does mindfulness does mindfulness work with teens with ADD or anxiety? It, all of it. It works. It, it works with all like any and everything. Like, we've had kids that we work with that. Um, have learned to control their ADD enough where they've been able to be taken off their medication because uh, they're, they're able to like filter it all through. They're able to slow their thoughts down and slow their mind down. And um, and they, they no longer, they won't, they no longer need their medication. So it definitely works. Okay, someone wants to know if mindfulness is related to yoga, Eastern religions or new age theory. And do you know, is it endorsed by professional health practitioners? Uh, I mean, there, you can look up the number of studies that have been done on um, yoga and mindfulness and meditation because uh, people are studying it because it's worked. Like it's been around for thousands of years and uh, people have been using it to to try to, to still themselves and to heal themselves up. Um, mindfulness isn't uh, isn't religious at all. Uh, mindfulness is just awareness practices. Um, you can be any religion and practice mindfulness um, and you can you can because uh, they're just like complementary tools to help you live a less stressful, more inwardly, outwardly peaceful life, uh, to connect with yourself, uh, be more em empathetic, more compassionate, um, to love yourself more, which in, in turn helps you um, love everybody around you more. And a lot of people commented tonight saying they very much enjoyed this and would love your contact information for those interested in training and learning more. Um, you can email, you, you can, the, so the Holistic Life Foundation website is, uh, W or uh, you don't need W is just HLF like Holistic Life Foundation HLFINC.org. 
Um, and you can email the Holistic Life Foundation at info, I-N-F-O, at hlfinc.org. Check us out on Facebook, check us out on Instagram, uh, but the website and the email are the, the best ways to get in contact with us. And Ms. Mathis, that's all from our audience. Well, we want to thank Mr. Smith for an enlightening and engaging evening. We certainly learned a lot tonight. I know that I did. I want to give you a big thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us and telling us more about the Holistic Life Foundation and all the positive benefits of mindfulness and meditation. And I would encourage the audience tonight to feel free to share your thoughts and experiences with us we take your feedback very seriously. Did we have any poll questions we wanted to ask tonight or have we done that already? Yes, we do. I can launch one now. Yeah, we take your feedback and that's what goes, that's the building blocks for what we present on these Thursday night sessions. So the more we hear from you, the better we hope that we're able to serve your needs. So we're optimistic that this is one that will be a big favorite. Well, of course, we encourage you to visit us at ncnw.org. Become a member if you're inclined to do that. And um, stay tuned because the, the Emotional Health is Wealth series will kick off uh, next month, which is October. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, NCNW is everywhere you are, at least we're trying to be. Twitter. And I want to thank you, Ms. Mathis, and the rest of the team and the uh, NCNW uh, for, for allowing me to uh, present tonight. Uh, it's a great platform. I'm, I'm really glad I was able to connect with you all and make this happen. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion that this will not be the last time that we gather together based on the reaction that we're getting. Um, this is. Right. Yeah. It's actually fascinating. I mean, the idea that children with ADD and, and who've experienced trauma at home and nervousness about test scores can benefit from learning how to breathe is pretty remarkable. And as I prepare for the night, I saw that there are now insurance companies, Blue Cross, Blue Shield and others who are beginning to add these practices to their reimbursement schedules because they understand the benefit that it has to health, overall health. It is fascinating. So we thank you and we want to especially thank Toyota and all of our team members and especially to our audience tonight. Thank you so much. Have we found those poll questions? Did the poll go up? Yes, they've all been launching. So we are on our last okay. one. And we'll share these poll results with you, Mr. Smith. Appreciate that. Yes, and don't forget to take the survey that will be delivered at the end of this webinar. Please do. That information, that feedback is so important to what we do and how well we're able to serve you. And that was our last poll question. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Thank you to all of our team members. And most of all, thank you to the audience for tuning in. We're here most Thursday nights. So check us out, ncnw.org. Thank you and good night.